this is Joe Ancola with GrowingYourGreens.com. Today I have another exciting episode for you. We're here on a field trip, and I'm excited about this episode, actually. It's gonna be real cool. Where we are, are actually in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is the desert, I mean, in the summer times it gets up to 115 degrees, and most front yards might look like the one right here. This is known as desert landscaping, and maybe not even super well-maintained. Things dry out, I mean, it's really hot. They, people think, oh yeah, this is what grows in the desert. Not much right but this is going to change your perception of that when we go back to the next house over where they literally have a fruit tree orchard in their yard that even despite the 115 degree weather does amazing and besides just the fruit tree orchard they also have vegetable gardens planted so what i'm going to do in this episode is actually share what some homeowners have done on their property that they bought just four years ago i mean they're already having productive fruit trees so uh Let's go to the next house and show you guys what they're doing. So now I want to share with you guys actually the viewer's house that I'm at today actually. They're one of my followers and follow some of the things I'm doing so I think that's really cool and they're using some of the practices that I recommend such as the nutrient dense uh, growing style so that's definitely really cool. And uh, what we're looking at here is their property and uh, this house you would never know it. I mean it looks so nice and they're still in the middle of construction because this was a fixer upper. They're on a half an acre and this half acre with the house, and this is a definite fixer upper with a lot of issues, let's say, um, cost them $115,000. So if you're looking for a good place to move, get a lot of land, be able to grow a lot of stuff like this, Las Vegas is your place. Actually, there's a year round growing season here, unlike the, you know, <laughs> the Northeast area where you're probably freezing in the winter time. And yeah, it could get a bit cold here, but no problem to grow year round. And what they've done, they've taken this fixer upper, that was a major fixer upper, this front yard actually was all rocked in. I mean, that's what desert landscaping and there's rocked in yards all over the place in Las Vegas. So they had to move actually every rock, you know, one rock at a time. So they got a nice workout and they basically pushed them to the side and they might make a wall or do something later. But they basically got the house four years ago, then three years ago. That's when they started planting out all the stuff. And, you know, I recommend if you guys have a fixer house or even if you're living in a house now, plant stuff now, ask questions later because, you know, if you just think, oh, I'm going to plant a tree tomorrow, tomorrow never comes and, you know, that's one day that the, tr fruit, the tree could have been growing and producing fruit for you. What I'm going to do now is actually throw up a few pictures of what this front yard used to look like. I mean, you guys could see that the front yard was just all the rocks. They had to move the rocks. The next picture you're looking at now is they actually dug big holes, three feet. Uh, wide and three feet deep to plant these guys and the picture now check it out they planted their trees and look at those trees man they ain't trees those are sticks they planted man but check it out now simply three years later following good practices getting some good compost and nutrient dense soil mixes and they're on a you know nutrient spray program these guys are fully productive after just three years and they're looking quite bountiful Let's go up to some of the trees and share with you guys uh, what they are and the one that I would pick if I was growing some trees like this here. So this is their front yard orchard right here and they got six trees at present time and they will expand to more. They also have experimented with like almond trees that they weren't so lucky with. So they're going to replant and you know, don't worry if one of your trees don't make it depending on where you got it, it might have a tree warranty which is really important. They purchase uh, many of the plants from Bay Laurel Nursery that has a policy they'll replace a tree once. So if it's not growing to your expectations, not doing well, doesn't make it, let them know and they'll replace it for you. Many other nurseries also have a tree warranty. So be sure to check this. One of my favorite nurseries that with the best tree warranty of, of all, above all others is actually Osh. It's a nursery or home improvement store located in California and they have a forever plant guarantee on vegetables and fruit trees. So then if you buy it there, no matter whatever happens, you can get a, a replacement there. So that's really cool. And what we're looking at here are the six trees they have. And uh, over on this front row, they got a row of three and with a lot of room to expand. So hopefully next time I come back, they'll have a lot more trees up here. But you know, the homeowners have a lot to do <laughs> and rebuild the house because it's a fixer, but also they've been working on the yard as much as they can. And uh, their total goal here is to actually uh, mulch this and do all this stuff, but they just haven't had time. So they just put in a temporary irrigation system on the top of the soil just to get their trees watered while they're working on their projects and they'll come back and then they'll finish this off one of these days. But guess what? Until then, these fruit trees are growing and they're producing fruit that the family here can eat. 
So this front row, they basically have three different types of apple trees. And, you know, I don't know about you, but apples are a dime a dozen. Apples would not be my first choice of things to plant in Las Vegas. Uh, this next row here, they have a fig tree followed by two Asian pears. And actually, yeah, Asian pears, they're pretty bit more unique. And I'd probably grow Asian pears before I grew apples. But my favorite tree of them all in the front yard is absolutely the fig. So uh, let's check that one out. So one of the things you're gonna notice about this fig tree is that, you know, if you could see closely in the video, I don't know if the camera could pick that up, but in the, in the back here, uh, the tree's white. That's not because it snows here in Vegas. Well, actually it does snow, but that's because they painted it actually white with a latex paint because the trees could get sun scald in the hot sun and even in the winter time. So they painted it white to prevent the damage. And another thing, because they painted it white, another cool thing is you can see where the white stops. And that's where they're done painting it. And then you can see all the new growth that's occurred since they painted. So like this year's growth, you, you could clearly see the difference in where it's growing. And uh, guess what? All the fruit is on this year's growth. Oh, and I think I see almost a ripe fig up here. Let's see if there's one right here. All right, uh, that's not quite ripe yet. But this fig tree is loaded with figs. I was actually eating figs off their tree earlier this morning, and they are definitely delicious. You know, I wanna encourage you guys, if you do grow fruit trees, to harvest your fruit at their complete ripeness. I was actually recently at a place that said, you know, selling some locally grown figs, had a sign in their front yard, figs, $4 a pound. I went there, bought some, tried some, and they're picking them far too early. Now, yes, they're good, but I asked them, why are you picking your figs early? You know, they're not fully ripe. They're not like, juicy and like like sugary like they should be she's like oh because the birds get them <laughs> if you don't pick them early so i'm like the solution to birds getting your figs are not picking them early they're to prevent the birds from getting in your figs and we'll show you how the homeowners here do that in the backyard but yeah this fig's quite productive and uh, you know i want to also encourage you guys to grow things that are expensive to buy it's quite unfortunate that apples and asian pears are fairly inexpensive to buy but figs i mean homegrown figs here in town four dollars a pound and they weren't even that good think about what some good tasting figs would taste like even if you go to the market figs are like five dollars i've seen them for eight dollars a pound sometimes figs but you could easily grow them and grow some amazing figs if you have your property and simply plant a fig tree so the fig tree here this is a black mission fig and this tree has produced the best tasting figs that I've ever tasted in Vegas I've tasted probably about I don't know half dozen or so cultivars here growing in Vegas and these by far are the best so far so at present time if you want to grow figs in Vegas I recommend the black mission now besides the front yard orchard which has six trees and they will expand later the backyard is where things are really at. So let's uh, head to the backyard and show you guys what's going on. All right, as you guys can see, we're now in the backyard and not only do they have another fruit tree orchard here, they also have some raised bed gardens that's growing lots of vegetables. And yes, even some fruit here in the desert, even through the 100 degree weather we've been having lately. So what we're gonna do now that we're in the backyard, we're gonna share with you more about how this came to be how they're planting things out. We're gonna take a look at the orchard, some of the trees, some of the best trees that are growing, how they've done this. And also, of course, the amazing vegetable garden they have in the background. And then we're actually gonna go inside and show you how they start their plants all from seed, different rare and unique heirloom varieties by using soil blockers. And we're gonna see some of their uh, fertilizers and soil amendments that they use to have this amazing uh, plant growth. So I guess the first thing, let's go ahead and uh, maybe sit down and share with you guys how they started this whole method to the madness to make all this happen. So I wanted to take a minute and sit down and share with you guys what the homeowners had to work with here. I mean, the house looks in fairly good condition and yeah, they're in construction and still modifying and making their house nicer because yes, this was a fixer upper and behind me is just evidence of that. What we have behind me is a swimming pool and you're like, John, why are they filling in the swimming pool? The swimming pool is nice to have. Well, number one, the swimming pool behind me was unpermitted as was many of the things else that was done on this property that the homeowners are having to go through trials and tribulations with the city, unfortunately, to make it right and just to get work approved and to do things to code and all this stuff. So uh, the swimming pool could have got tore out and put back in, but that's just too much work. So what they decided to do was they're actually just filling it and they're all filling it by hand. This is manual labor. 
You know, one of the things I like about garden is that it gets you outside, gets you get some sun to make some vitamin D, which is so good for us, but also gives us some labor, you know, some manual labor. I think in this day and age, people sit far too long behind computers watching YouTube videos, so get out there and garden after you guys watch this. And, you know, people are designed to move. We're designed to move, man. We're not designed to be sitting on a couch watching TV all day or sitting behind a computer screen working at the computer all day. I'm lucky that I've set up my life so that I could work a couple hours or half the day and then go out and garden the rest of the day. And, you know, I encourage everybody to get out and do some real world activity because it is that healthy for you. Nonetheless, they've had this swing pool that they're now actually going to basically cover up. They're going to um, fill it up. And what they're going to do in there is actually going to plant raised bed garden on top of it. Now, one of the other cool things they might want to do because they already have a really nice hole if I had a swimming pool like this, I'd actually probably build just a structure, like a greenhouse structure over it, and then be able to have like a sunken garden. Because the swimming pool is so deep, you know, it's gonna basically uh, retain the, the, the regulated temperature, much like if you go into like a mine. It's always cooler in the mine than outside. So uh, at, at a lower, you know, elevation in the swimming pool, it's gonna remain a constant temperature. This can be especially good for gardening in the winter time and they've already done the work and dug it all out for you. So there are plans for people doing this already and I forget the exact name, what they call it, but that's definitely really cool and that's what I'd use that space for instead of just filling it up and building raised beds on top. Then I'd build hoop houses to put over, right? I'd build a massive hoop house to put over the top of that and then be able to walk in down into my greenhouse garden or build raised beds at the base of that swim pool. So that'd be really cool. But anyways, that's their plan. and. Um, Let's talk about plans actually. You know, before they started this project, and I think everybody out there should do this if they're serious about growing food at their place, especially if you bought it and own it, you wanna have a plan, because without a plan, you're lost. If, it, if a plane takes off to go to Hawaii and it doesn't know where it's going, it's just fly around for hours wasting gas, you know? Uh, so a plane has a destination in mind when it takes off, and you also should have a destination in mind when you're planning out what you want to grow at your home. So what they've done is uh, ard ardently, wait, ard is that a word ardently? I don't know, but uh, judiciously, I don't know, whatever the word is, they basically made a plan, and this is an eight and a half by 11. They basically have it um, all to scale as to their backyard, their front yard, and their house. And uh, this is a half an acre, so their house doesn't take up too much space. So they have a lot of space to play with. And you know, a lot of it right now is just basically gravel, dirt, nothing and they're working on slowly growing things out and they're doing this in stages. So they're not doing it all overnight. I don't recommend you guys do it all overnight either. You know, do a little bit of time, learn as you grow, plant things. They're gonna learn, oh, when we did it this way, it didn't work so good. And now we're gonna, you know, do the other half of the garden a little bit differently so that we can improve it and make it better. So anyways, their current plan basically has about 40 fruit trees on this half acre property, as well as a lot of placing, uh, placement for, uh, uh, raised bed gardens as well as placement for um, perennial edible crops such as blueberries and goji berries and asparagus and artichokes definitely really cool and uh, you know they got the irrigation where that's gonna be running to already piped in under the ground ready to grow for when they do expand and that's definitely very important so yeah have a plan so once they had their plan then they basically started just planting the trees and uh, and building their raised beds. So next, let's go ahead over to the orchard and share with you guys uh, some of the trees they planted, the spacing between it, how they're keeping their trees smaller, how they're protecting it from birds. Oh man, this is gonna be so fun. Let's go ahead and check it out. So what we're looking at now is just a small section of their backyard orchard. They have over a dozen fruit trees here in the backyard. And I love when I get to visit a new place because I get to see the different trees, see how they're growing, see which ones are healthier, which ones are producing more. So I could share that with you guys and share you guys, share with you guys the best of the best because they've definitely learned by planting different varieties which ones uh, do the best and which ones maybe don't grow so well. As you guys can see behind me, what they're doing is they basically got a, a structure made out of EMT conduit and some connectors uh, just with some standard um, clips that hold on some bird netting. So this helps keeps the birds out and maybe we'll do a close up on that to show you guys. Um, they have uh, different things like uh, apriums, uh, apricots, plums, and some peaches, nectarines, uh, pomegranates uh, currently planted in the backyard. 
and actually some of them are fruiting right now at this time. So actually maybe let's go over to one of the fruit trees that's loaded up with fruits and uh, talk more about it. So what we're looking at now is a pluot tree and uh, you guys can see some pluots here. They're not quite ripe yet, but you know, this tree is loaded with fruit. I don't know if you guys could see that on the video, but this thing has so much fruit, it's totally insane. And guess what? Yes, these were only planted three years ago. Three years ago, in three years, you could have this much fruit, so plant a tree tomorrow if you haven't already. And these were started from a bare root, from little twigs that came out of the ground. Now, you might be thinking, John, is that a multi-graph tree? You could have a tree with like different varieties on it, because we got, you know, a certain variety of pluot on this side, and then on this side, we got a different variety. But no, these are actually not two varieties. What they're doing as a technique is they're doing a, a two tree, one hole technique. So I like, yeah, uh, two girls for one guy. It's kind of the same thing, you know. The guys will like it. And <laughs> the trees like it because they help pollinate each other. So uh, on one side of the hole, which is 18 inches, they plant, you know, the, the tree. And I'll show you a really good example of this. Um, each side of the hole, then they kind of keep them pruned back so that it makes a full tree. And then like each uh, part of the uh, tree is just half, so they prune this back judiciously to try to like make, keep one on one side and one on the other side and no commingling. And it's doing pretty well. Looks like these trees got fully pollinated and they're producing quite nicely. So the pluots, they've been doing quite good for them here in Vegas. Let's go ahead and take a look at some other experimental trees that haven't produced yet after the three years they've been in the ground. So here's a really good example to show you guys the concept of uh, two trees one hole basically they got a three foot um, wide diameter circle and three feet deep hole that they've dug out of this uh this hard soil here and we'll show you guys how they did that to make it super easy and they got a little uh you know recessed area that holds the water and they filled this up with compost and they basically planted the trees in there and what we're looking at here are two cherry trees that i think produce a total of like one or two cherries this year after three years Maybe in future years it'll grow bigger and produce a lot more fruit. But if you want your fast return on an investment, then definitely the Pluot or maybe even the next one I'm going to show you guys. That's probably the number one fruit tree to plant in Vegas. If uh, you, know, you want to plant a fruit tree that's just really easy to manage and take care of. So I could show you this tree and just the greenery behind me, but you're not seeing any fruit on it. And this is the tree that I would recommend you guys plant if you want to have a productive tree that does really well here in the desert. This one's known as an aprium, and this is known as the Flavor Saver Aprium. So this tree, after three years, produced a bountiful harvest of the apriums. And in addition, the reason why the homeowners like it here is because this tree was trouble-free. The apriums, the fruit came in really early. It wasn't bothered by pests, diseases, or birds, or anything produce a lot for them and now it's here to live the rest of the year and grow larger so that I could produce for them again next year. So because this is an early tree it didn't have all the challenges that some of the other trees have. So let's go ahead and take a look at a high maintenance tree much like that high maintenance griffin you might have had back in college. So this my friends is what you call a high maintenance tree. It's the one behind me. Um, it's done fruiting for the year. This is known as the Saturn peach. The Saturn peach are ones that are not like the round peaches, but they're more of a flat peach. And I love Saturn peaches for me to eat personally, but knowing what I know now, I would never grow one in Las Vegas. I mean, Saturn peaches, they're one of the most delicious peaches to me. They're the sweetest, they have a good flavor, but they're high maintenance, man. Who wants to deal with the high maintenance? I wanna go for easy, right? I wanna get that easy girl instead of the high maintenance girl. <laughs> Anyways, um, so the Saturn peach, as you guys can see, um, they had to basically uh, put bird netting over it and even the bird netting they used, which I'll show the diameter on that, um, small birds were still able to get in there and eat the fruit because the fruit was highly desirable to the birds. In addition, what happened was because the fruits are so small, they would um, drop off the tree after the birds plucked them because they were damaged and then they actually would, they would ferment on the ground. So they weren't able to harvest as many of them as they would have liked. So yeah, and then it also had some other challenges with some, uh, some bugs and some pests. So yeah, you could choose, okay, I want Saturn peaches because they taste so good, but then you gotta do a lot of extra stuff. You gotta cover it, you gotta spray, you gotta watch out for the bugs. Or you could grow an aprium tree like they did here. Very little maintenance, very little care that produced bountiful harvest, which much less effort. 
So I want to encourage you guys out there to, you know, grow trees. There are going to be a lot less effort that are going to produce for you so you can spend more time doing other stuff, planting different trees, tending your vegetable garden, instead of playing with your trees and protecting them uh, all the time and then not even getting that much fruit off of them. So I want to talk about bird protection or bird netting. And this is the bird netting they're using. It's a fine weave. Looks like it's maybe like a half inch diameter. Now this was not small enough to keep out the smaller birds. So next time they're going to maybe go to like quarter inch diameter to keep out the smaller birds. And this is a very easy setup. Basically, they've just basically uh, stuck a couple uh, rebar stakes in the ground and put this uh, EMT conduit over it. The EMT conduit's relatively inexpensive at a local big box hardware store. Then they got the special connectors up at the top, which you can order online because many stores or nurseries won't sell these. But just order four connectors online, get some EMT conduit at a local big box store and some uh, bird netting and you got an instant protection from birds and other wildlife so you can build something like this to put over your raised bed vegetable garden you know you could also put up shade cloth on a structure similar to this that we're going to look at at a second that's over their vegetable garden and this is the easiest way to control for certain pests you know birds and large insects can't fly through the netting to get your stuff if you're on the ground, you would put rocks on it as, if they, as they have done, and wildlife can't get in to eat your stuff. I mean, this is not rocket science. You don't need to spray toxic pesticides or bird deterrents and all this kind of stuff. Just simply, you know, build a little screen house for your trees and your plants and keep them inside, right? You don't want pests in your house. That's why you shut your door at night, right? We'll build a little house, outdoor greenhouse for your trees and your plants to keep them safe as well, and it is really that easy. So despite having the bird netting up over their trees, they still have some challenges with uh, ground squirrels. So what they're doing is instead of using toxic poison baits and whatnot to kill the squirrels, they're actually catching them here and then they can choose to release them or do whatever they want with the squirrels once they got them to get them off their property to somewhere else, to greener pastures, let's say. Uh, please keep in mind that relocating wildlife that you trap on your own property, if you do take it somewhere else, it's illegal in many places. So I'm not necessarily recommending you do that, but if I was to catch uh, wildlife and creatures, I would just want to rehome them, you know, somewhere else other than my property, you know, and just do it under cover of darkness. All right, what I want to share with you guys next is a jackhammer. They got a jackhammer. I'm going to jack you up here. And uh, why they got the jackhammer was literally you know, digging in this hard soil here would be back-breaking labor. But they've done it themselves easily with this little jackhammer here that they got on Amazon. I will mention the brand name. It's the CMT Model 10309 65 millimeter demolition hammer, um, 112 volts, 1240 watts, made in China. So this uh, jackhammer has basically an interchangeable bottom. They got a pick end on this currently but they also have a shovel in to dig. And basically you put it down and jack it in and check it out. I mean, it's really that easy. So yes, buying some tools to save you tons of time is definitely worth it in my opinion. I mean, this thing has already paid for itself because they're getting plenty of fruit off their trees and they still got plenty more holes to dig with this jackhammer to even get more benefits out of it. All right, so that's how they dig some of the holes. Let's go ahead now and share with you guys their luscious vegetable garden that's growing a lots of vegetables here in the summer in Las Vegas. So as you guys can see behind me, this is their vegetable garden area. Basically they're building a lot of square foot raised bed gardens, uh, four feet wide by it looks like about, I don't know, 20 feet long on some of these beds. And then they have some beds that are just 10 feet by 10 feet, which are actually quite large. Each one of the beds are growing something a little bit differently in and uh, over part of the garden they actually have one of those similar structures up that they're putting the bird netting on to keep the birds out but this one actually has a shade cloth a small percentage shade cloth I'm gonna guess maybe 30 percent shade cloth to keep some of the the you know some of the the heat and the Sun off some of the plants so that may do better with production or not it's my personal opinion that I'm not a big believer in using the shade cloths I want to make my environment good for my plants including building the soil up so that they could be more resistant to the hot weather instead of giving them some uh, sun protection like sunscreens do for people you know it's my personal belief that you know we're not made to have sunscreen plants are not made to live in the shade 
except that they're shade loving plants but a lot of the fruiting crops really love the sun and by shading them you may be limiting your production but also you may be helping them so uh, that's what they decided to do here and I think it's cool I think you guys should always experiment and I like that they actually have some under shade some under not and they're specifically planting certain plants under the shade cloth and the same plants outside of the shade cloth to see which ones will do better you know maybe in the shade cloth plants are gonna do better than not and it looks like a very simple and easy structure to put up if you do intend and want to shade your crops in addition this is also valuable because this structure can be used in the winter time to put some agrobond or some other material to make a mini greenhouse kind of structure which probably would be a good thing here in the desert in the winter let's go ahead and take a look at the raised bed construction and some of the things they're planting in the raised beds at this time so now let's talk about the raised bed construction they're using basically two by six lumber they have them stacked three high so this makes i don't know probably a little bit over a foot of depth with i which i believe is a really excellent depth to have here in las vegas and the wood they're using looks really cool it's like nice and finished and stuff now this is all non-toxic stains they're using here and what they've done is they've just simply bought inexpensive cheap pine lumber and the pine lumber is the lumber that's normally used for construction inside your house and not necessarily recommended for outside use but this will save you a ton of money by using the pine lumber now the pine lumber will probably not last like a lot of years you might get five years out of it especially if you treat it properly and it'll be interesting to see how this garden holds up um, but th that's what they've used because it's inexpensive and it looks relatively nice using the special mineral based treatments that they've used later in this episode we'll go in the house and show you guys some of the specific products they use to make all this happen they basically have a header a drip system here and they basically have uh, drip emitters every 12 inches and it's basically the drip tape um, you know the or the drip the drip line with built-in emitters and in this garden they have a lot of different things planted you know I like to plant usually one plant per garden here they like to intermix things and I like intermixing things but for me the challenge is when you intermix different plants like they grow at different rates so some may get shaded and some will not get shaded um, in addition what you're seeing here they have a little hoop house here this hoop house specifically meant for use in the winter time um, you know to keep things a little bit warmer and they've built this hoop house themselves out of the same EMT conduit they didn't buy these already preformed they actually bought a tubing bender which I'll show you guys in a little bit you guys could bend your own EMT conduit and make professional looking hoop houses like this for actually very little money so I guess next we're gonna go ahead and go in some close-ups on some of the different beds and some of the crops are growing uh, at this time here in the summer so the first thing I want to show you guys is although they have a half acre here they also want to conserve space and grow things vertically especially when they're planting a mixed raised bed with eggplants and onions and basil and marigolds and Swiss chard tomatoes and sunflowers I mean all the different things I'm seeing in this bed they're all mixed up so you know if the tomatoes sprawled all over it would literally cover some of the other things that are nearby so what they've done instead is they're trellising it up so once again they basically made a system using the EMT conduit with some connectors. This is just a T connector here. And they have a, the bar going up the top and they've uh, just basically just made a little frame and they're using one of my favorite uh, nylon string trellises as temporary use, although in the future they will use hog panels. Um, and this is removable. So after the summer season, they could take this down and then they could basically utilize their hoop house. In the meantime, this, uh, hoop uh, system provides support to have these trellises to go up so they have a tomato trellis on the side you can't see they have this t tomato trellis here which is doing really nice so it's a uh, offering minimal shade for the plants below it it's also not sprawling out so it lets these guys uh, you know grow below they're also um, you know pruning the tomatoes that they can grow and then behind in the back picture you guys are seeing a, an amazing cucumber plant that they're also trellising up and uh, looks like it's growing amazingly as well. So here's another shot of their raised beds here, one of the four foot by, I don't know, 20 foot raised beds. And uh, what I wanna show you guys in this is they actually planted some heirloom sweet potatoes, you know? So they ordered heirloom sweet potato slips, which are little plants from a company. And then they shipped them to them and they planted them and they're growing really well. They got a bunch of different rare, unique varieties of sweet potatoes. I always wanna encourage you guys to grow heirloom, unique and rare varieties of things and save your seeds. To pass those on to future generations plus you're going to see how the heirlooms grow for you plus they probably also 
maybe even taste better than some of the common available commercial varieties grown today. Now besides just the sweet potatoes they got in here, some of the other crops that I really want you guys to focus on in the desert are some of the ones they've grown here. Number one, the Swiss chard. Swiss chard's the number one a leafy green to grow in the winter and even the summer in Las Vegas. It loves the heat, it does quite well. And then uh, the next one here we got is uh, Egyptian spinach or malohia. Actually it's growing well as well. It's also known as the jute. And uh, yeah, the, the leaves are quite good, have a nice mild, small mucilaginous flavor, best eaten raw in my opinion. And then uh, behind there, a little bit ways back, you guys could kind of see it back there. It's actually known as the New Zealand spinach. This is the first time I've seen New Zealand spinach growing in Las Vegas, and it looks like it's doing quite well. And I always recommend you guys to grow your leafy greens. I know in the summertime, many of us focus on growing the fruiting crops like the peppers and the eggplants and tomatoes and watermelons, and we forget about the leafy greens, but leafy greens are quite important. Actually, it's the name of my channel for a reason. I believe we should eat leafy greens every single day in our diet. My goal every day is to eat two pounds of leafy greens. Most days I definitely get to one, but uh, my goal is two pounds. And by easily juicing the leafy greens or putting them in a blender to make a green smoothie, you can definitely up your leafy green percentage quite easily. So what we're looking at now is a 10 foot by 10 foot raised bed. You might be thinking, John, that goes against all your principles, man, because you can't reach in and get to all the different plants on the inside of the bed. And I think they've done quite a good job with a 10 by 10 bed. You know, they may have to walk on the bed to get to some parts of it. I'd probably have a four foot by four foot bed with a little walkway down the middle, but it's, it's doing quite well. And what they're growing in this bed, and there's a reason for the 10 by 10 is, is because they're growing heirloom, rare, and unique varieties of melons here in the desert, which are all heirloom varieties. And the melons like to really vine out and sprawl. Now, while you could truss them up, it would be a pain. They're letting them just sprawl out. This is also good because, you know, the leaves of the plants will protect the fruit from the fruit burn, which can also be a challenge here in the hot desert sun. So what I want to share with you guys in this bed is actually they have these little irrigation flags. So I think that this is a really good idea. I haven't seen this done anywhere else before. Is the, uh, the yellow irrigation flags that you've seen behind me denote where the plant was planted. So when they go into water, they could water in that general area to hit the root zone of the plant. Next, they have the little like uh, orange flags. The orange flags denote the fruits that are growing in there so that when they're, they could go and check them as they find them to see if they got any ripe ones. Let's next go ahead and look over at how they're growing and protecting some of the fruits from damage, you know, against some of the bugs and creatures in the soil. So now I want to show you guys what they got here. They got a little melon and it's uh, not just sitting on the soil because I have had melons that get eaten out by bugs but what they got, let me see if I can lift this up without damaging it too much, is they got these little uh, trays. You guys might have had these when you were kids. You put like a little paper plate on here so it has structure for the paper plate. But basically what this allows is this keeps the melon off the dirt so you get less bug damage. The holes in here lets water drain should they water or it rains so that you won't get the rot. So, uh, you know, they just put it this way up. I might put it like this way up, set the melon on top so there's a little bit of air circulation underneath. But nonetheless, I think this is an excellent method to, to keep your melon safe. And this is just a little watermelon growing and they got at least a half dozen different varieties of heirloom melons and they got all the seeds from the Baker Creek Seed Company. And they've started all the plants or the vegetables you've seen in this video, they started from seed and I always encourage you guys to start your plants from seed if you possibly can. You know, uh, sometimes if you're too late for the season, you gotta buy some plants or whatnot. But starting your seeds by far is the best because you can, you know, know the plant's whole history, especially here in the desert where it is quite hot and hardening off your plants can be a challenge. So actually next, let's go ahead and show you guys how they start their plants inside and how they harden them off before they plant them outside to get this amazing growth. So another very important component to having fruit trees in an orchard and even the vegetables that I will show you in a little bit is actually having um, the bees. So the bees help with the pollination. Without the pollination, 30% of the crops available in America today, you would not be eating. It's quite sad that the bees are under attack from, in my opinion, the chemical pesticides and herbicides and all this kind of stuff. And it's really good to keep your own bees, in my opinion, to increase pollination for your crops. Also, maybe get a little bit of honey out of it but more importantly, to preserve the bees and provide them a home where they're not being doused with chemicals every day 
or being trucked around the country and being enslaved to pollinate fruit for you. So here they're going to have a nice home and they're going to be able to just not even go that far to have all the pollen off the fruits and the vegetables. In addition, if you look closely over on behind the hive, you'll see like a little chicken feeder, uh, chicken water feeder. And that's not for actually chickens, that's actually for the bees because the bees do like some water. So it's nice that they have that there for the bees. They're giving the bees a happy home. And at the same time, the bees are working for them to help pollinate and increase their fruit production. Now, another thing that no garden should be without is a compost pile. They have a small compost pile here. What I would recommend in their orchard-like uh, situation here is probably getting a wood chipper and definitely expanding out their compost pile so that every branch, tree, limb, leaf, that, and vegetable you know, clipping that comes off uh, you know, their plants here go back into the compost uh, their pile to enrich and break down so that they could refeed their soil some of the excellent nutrition and nutrient density that they're putting in their soil. So while they are growing some peaches here, everything is not always peachy keen when you're growing your food. And I want to share this with you guys. What we have here are two empty loan holes. It's quite unfortunate. They spent time to dig out three foot uh, wide by three foot deep holes. They planted some fruit trees, including like uh, uh, some citrus, like a Meyer lemon, and it didn't quite make it due to the freeze. And that's all right, you know, you lose a tree, guess what, you know, you try, try again. So they're gonna try another tree in this hole, another probably citrus, and they're gonna protect it uh, better when it's younger, maybe put some lights on it, build a structure over it. And then the other hole, which I'm looking forward to, they're gonna get a cold, hardy variety of avocado to experiment with. And yes, it's not guaranteed to make fruit like some of these other ones I showed you guys, but if you have extra space and you love avocados, you might want to try to get a cold hearty one. So I'm really looking forward to when they put that in and I could come over and maybe grab an avocado too off a of Las Vegas grown avocado. Probably one of the only trees that's producing in Vegas if they're successful. So what I'm looking at now is some other trees I would highly encourage you guys to grow in Las Vegas. If you really want low maintenance and you want to get some really delicious and nutrient dense fruits with a lot of anthocyanins and antioxidant pigments contained within them. We all know that the pomegranate is one of the most healthiest fruits. Pomegranates, unlike apples, sell for a lot of money in the store. They actually fair, they store fairly well also, which is really a good thing so that you can you know, keep some of the fruit you know, longer than having to eat it as it ripens up, like you know, say the plums or the apriums. And uh, pomegranates, they do amazing in the desert with very little care. Next, I want to remind you guys that when you go buy a pomegranate a tree, don't just go to the Home Depot and buy the pomegranate tree they got there. You're only going to get one variety, probably the wonderful variety, which in my opinion is not the tastiest or best pomegranate to grow. There are literally hundreds of different varieties of pomegranates. Actually, I can think of a place, Exotica Fruit Nursery in Southern California that has 200 varieties of pomegranate trees growing that they make available for you guys. I mean, 200 varieties, that blows my mind. All the different flavors, all the different colors, all the different textures of the fruit. My personal favorites on the pomegranates are actually the, uh, the white palms that are actually more sweet than tart. And that'd be, the, my, that'd be my choice for growing here in the Las Vegas desert. So now I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys how they start their seeds indoors. This is very important to get your seeds started early when it's still too cold to plant them outside so that your seeds and your plants that you grow are at the, at the right height at the right time so you could maximize your growing season. This is a little two by four structure they built with a fluorescent lighting that we'll go ahead and give you guys a close up on and specifically how they're growing. And then behind you'll see a whole bunch of color coded buckets, I mean, they have a lot of different soil nutrients. Then I'll go over a few of them with you guys to share with you guys what they're using here and how they're storing it, which is actually quite neat. I need a system like this personally. So how they're starting their seeds is basically they got a special like uh, uh, fixture, fluorescent light fixture that uses the T5 lamps. This is normally going to be used for hydroponic or indoor gardening. It's actually quite bright. Uh, this is a specialized setup that can get expensive, but you know, feel free to go down to your local big box store and just get some shop lights with some good bulbs. And you know, they're going to perform maybe not quite as well as these guys. And they basically built this shelf to fit this whole um, light system. And then they basically have these uh, trays here, which is really cool. 
They got these uh, bottom green trays that um, the water can't go through, plus they have some special tongs here. They also have a heat mat underneath here to keep the right temperature, especially when you're starting your seeds in the cold winter time. This is gonna keep them a little bit warmer because some seeds like to germinate when it's warm out. And then next what they have here is quite ingenious. They have basically a little tray with the holes in it that actually they put in the tray without the holes in it so when they water, the water doesn't you know, seep down. And then what they're doing here is they're using these things called the soil blocks. So instead of using more plastic, they're basically got a soil blocking tool here that they make a special mix of the soil. They wet the soil, they put this in there which basically makes a mold and then they basically push this out and then it puts a little divot in the top so that you can really you know, plant your seeds fast. Also, this will reduce the transplant shock because now you don't need to remove the plants out of the little plastic container. And in addition, in the soil block, the roots really won't grow out of the soil block because the roots will hit the air, so they'll probably like, you know, air prune themselves. So you're probably gonna get healthier plants because of it. And uh, yeah, this is how they start them. All in here, all the plants you guys saw outside were all started in here under this light setup. Now besides having the lights, the proper you know, ways to store the plants, the, the, um, the blocking tool, having the heat mat underneath. Another very important component is they're doing, which is cool, I don't know if you guys can see that, they have a layer of insulation on the bottom, which I like a lot, I haven't seen too many places. You can also put insulation or like aluminum foil on the back you know, wall that's white to reflect some light, which would be cool. They kind of done that on the side, it's uh, white. But another thing that's very important that many people do not do to their plants is put up a fan. Air circulation is very important for plants. You may get diseases if you don't circulate some air. Plus, I also think that you know circulating some air on the plants and giving them some resistance, which would happen outside, makes them a little bit stronger. You know, when they're when they're growing up. Now, another thing besides starting their plants out, another thing that they've learned that's quite important is hardening their plants off. You know. Uh, hardening off your plants, meaning if you just take your plants, grow them inside until they're nice and yay big and you take them outside, put them in your garden, they're going to freak out because the weather inside is a lot more different than the weather outside, especially here in the extreme Las Vegas heat. They need to harden their plants off early instead of later. So as soon as the plants start getting their first set of true leaves, they start taking this whole flat out you know, maybe just for an hour a day putting them outside and then bringing them back in. And they might keep this up for a week and then the next week they might do two hours a day. And everybody has their own scheme on how much or how little to do this. But basically you want to get the plants acclimated to the weather. It's like if you're in Alaska and it's freezing and you go on a vacation in Hawaii, you get off the plane and you're like, oh my gosh, it's so hot, right? Because you're not used to it. So we need to make these plants used to the weather. And that's important no matter where you live. I see a lot of challenges with new gardeners thinking, oh, I got these great plants, they're doing really well. I'm just gonna plant them out and then they don't make it. And that's one of the biggest reasons why is because they're not hardened off properly. So probably another thing I admire about the gardeners here is that they're really taking the nutrient dense approach to gardening. Now many of you guys may have not heard that before. I do talk about this on my show by adding the rock dust and the trace minerals and basically providing everything the plant needs besides just the NPK fertilizer that many of you guys hopefully are not using right now that you just buy in the you know blue powdery stuff that you mix in, right? That doesn't give the plants everything they need. I mean, especially here in the desert heat, it's very critical. The healthier you could have your plants, right? The healthier they're gonna be, they'll be more resistant to the extreme heat, to the weather, to the pests, than just putting down a standard NPK fertilizer, right? I know you guys take a lot of time. It took a lot of time to dig three foot holes, put the soil in there, mail order the trees, put them in the hole. I mean, if you have a kid, are you just gonna kick your kid out of the house at 18 and let him go into the world and figure it out? Or are you gonna try to save money for him so you can go to college and you're gonna invest in his future? When you take care and nourish the soil, you're investing in the future of your plant, the future of your plant's health, the future of its production, and more importantly, the production of nutrient dense foods that are higher in nutrients, taste sweeter, taste better, and are gonna give you a greater level of health in my opinion. And that's why they have a lot of this stuff here. Now, in my opinion, these are not simply fertilizers. These build the soil, which is very important. And I have a really good episode on building the soil versus fertilizers. You know, I'll maybe put a link down below to that video. 
but they're using a lot of the same products that I use in my home. They got actually a few new ones that I actually haven't seen before, which is cool. But basically, one of the main programs they did when they started growing was they started using the John and Bob's products. They heard a local lecture here. John and Bob's rep talked about the products, including the Nourish Biosol, the microbes and minerals, and some of the different John and Bob's products, including the Penetrate uh, Liquid Biotiller, which adds the beneficial microbes in the soil. Actually, I sprayed those this morning in my garden. But Billy, really, we want to build the soil. I mean, here in the desert, this soil is is crap. I mean, it's not that good to grow in, so they've enriched it, and they're bringing fertility back in the soil by adding many of these things. Some of the things they have here is the soft rock phosphate, the azomite, glacial rock dust, they got the worm castings optimized, I know they're the John and Bob's products, and they got them all in these cool buckets here. Let me go ahead and show you guys these buckets. What these buckets are, these are just standard like five gallon buckets, but these are like the ultimate supreme five gallon buckets because they're like transparent, see-through, very high quality. They got these at the Winco Foods here in town. In addition, they got these cool lids. Most of the time on a buck, you gotta like pry the lid off, it's a pain. These are just basically spin-off tops. And you just basically spin the top off and now you can get to everything in your bucket. These are food storage grades. If you're storing food or your rock dust or whatever, you guys could do it with these tops. These are actually called the Gamma Seal Lid at a Gamma Plastics Corporation in uh, San Diego. So definitely recommend these. I own a couple of them myself. Really nice way to keep all your nutrients for your garden. Really a nice way to keep all the nutrients for your garden safe and contained. They have labels on all of them so they can easily see what they are. And I really need to do this to all my bag product because they're just in bags half folded over and the bags are half rotten out. So uh, one of these days I'm gonna do that. They've even color coded the handles here. Definitely really nice that they're doing that to keep everything neat and organized so that they can uh, get on their programs with uh, adding these to their soil. So aside from all these fertilizers, they have some other uh, products that they spray on their crops as well. Uh, they've read a few books about the subject that they basically follow that's basically given them the results that they've gotten here. So we'll share those with you guys. But I wanna go over and maybe share one of the uh, products they're, they're using to repel the pest that I really like a lot that actually I sprayed in my very backyard last night. So the neem oil is the one natural organic pesticide that I would recommend you guys use. Actually it's the one I sprayed actually just last night in my garden. They're also using it here. This is the uh, Ahimsa Organics neem oil cold press wild crafted and 100% organic and armory listed. I definitely like this stuff a lot. Now besides the neem oil they have here they also have the uh, Orange Guard, which is what I use to control ants in my place. It also works very well. It's basically extracted from uh, orange peels, the D-limonene. So uh, it can be used around food and it's pet safe. So I always like to and encourage you guys to use you know, pet safe and human safe um, natural alternatives to chemical pesticides. And these are just two of them that can cover a wide range of challenges. Now aside from some of the pest controls, they also have liquid liquids they put and foil or feed onto their crops on a weekly, weekly feeding cycle. I don't know if they put this one on a weekly feeding cycle, but this is actually called the seed crop concentrate. This is basically a sea mineral based solution that is sprayed onto the crops, whether using the seed crop, the C90 or the ocean grown ocean solution product. I think that's very important and essential to use in your garden. Now, Besides just the sea crop they're using, they basically have a spray recipe. So they actually, they're quite organized here, which is boggles my mind because I'm not super organized and have everything planned out. It's just all in my head, a little bit more spontaneous. But they have a holistic spray recipe that they came up with from one of the books I'll show you near the end of this video with neem oil, soap emulsifier, molasses, sea kelp, liquid fish, microbes, and sea crop. And they have exactly the plan that they need to do to make it, the recipe, and then they put it in a backpack sprayer and then spray it on once a week. So I think, uh, you know, regular fertilization of your crops can be very important. I mean, we eat every day and our crops also want to have some nutrition. As much as I like to add things to the soil to have it available for the crops, I think foiler feeding is also very essential and very important to have the utmost level of plant health here in the desert to give your plants every possible advantage to you know, uh, 
to thrive in the 115 degree weather that we'll be having in just a few weeks. So now I want to talk about one of these specific uh, soil additives that they have that I've never seen before and actually they said cost a pretty penny actually. It's actually called the Transplant Formula and it's from Mineralized Gardens. It's um, mineralizedgardens.com is the website and uh, this is simply for adding to the transplant soil so that the plant, the transplants have all the nutrition they need. One of the things that I really want to impart on you in this episode is that you know it's very important the health of the plants not only for their long-term stability when they're adult and producing food for you but even more importantly when they're children uh, you know whether they're children and they're child plants or whether they're real children we know that you know if your child eats a healthy diet now that's going to affect him for the rest of his life and he's going to have he or she's going to have a higher level of health later because he has a good foundation he started on and just like with your plants that you're growing from seed or from the, you know, the tree whips, the trees that you're starting and planting out, it's very important to basically provide them everything they need, all the nutrients they need when they're younger because if they're stunted when they're un younger, they're not going to be as productive and be as healthy when they're older. And so that's why they use this uh, transplant formula despite the high price and I'm going to definitely look into this to see if this could help me uh, make my transplants healthier whether I'm going to just maybe put a transplant formula together with some of the other products that I already use because in all my transplant mixes that I make, I put a lot of the common products, the azomite, the glacial rock dust, the worm castings that I would normally use anyways and this might just be a all-in-one product that you don't have to mix, you know, but it might be something new and different that I'm going to look into for sure. All right, now we're inside out of the hot heat and I want to show you guys some of the different uh, books that they've learned how to garden because literally they've never really gardened before before they bought the property and started growing the food here and they've learned as they grow and that's how I encourage you guys to do it. Also of course, of course they've learned uh, you know probably from some of my videos but they have some uh, you know some books that they really refer to to keep them on the track. So one of the books they like a lot is the Holistic Orchard Tree Fruits and Berries the Biological Way so I, I recommend the biological style of gardening. And uh, Michael Phillips, the author here, is primarily an apple orchard grower, but the things he says in this book not only applies to apples, but also applies to other fruits. So they like this book a lot, probably their favorite book, you know, for orchard growing. And in addition, another one they like a lot, and this is having to do with the vegetables, is The Intelligent Gardener Growing Nutrient Dense Food. Now I've talked about nutrient dense food before and you know many of you guys might know that I often claim that leafy greens are a nutrient dense food and yes leafy greens have more nutrients than calories and more antioxidants, phytochemicals and phytonutrients and minerals just by nature but when we're using the term nutrient dense here that means that uh, the given kale leaf for example compared to a kale leaf from the store, kale leaf grown here has more nutrients in it. So some of the studies I've seen is that you know protein in a store-bought versus nutrient-dense leaf, there could be double the amount of protein in the same leaf or the same green bean, for example, just by having the proper nutrients in the soil. So if you're going to take the time to be digging three foot by three foot holes and to invest in bringing in soil and wood chips and, and buying mail order trees and doing all this stuff, you might as well just do it right to the best of your ability to provide you guys the best food with the most nutrition so you can eat half as much. Some of the minerals that are in the foods that are growing, you know, the minerals could be double as much as something store bought. So you'll literally need half the food. You will not need to eat as much food because it'll have more nutrition in there, you know, in, in the same amount of leaf. Plus, of course, nutrient dense foods taste better. And these are just benefits for us, but the benefits go far beyond us. The benefits also go for the plants because the plants will be more, you know, disease, bug, pest resistant and more weather resistant, especially here in Las Vegas. I think this is very important and there's not, unfortunately, too many nutrient dense growers here. So the uh, Intelligent Gardener is basically their guidebook to basically make it all happen. It has recipes, specifically what to do. I give a lot of generalities and what I do in my show. And, I'm, frankly, I haven't read these books. I've done a lot of research and I have my own way of doing things which comply a lot with, with these uh, you know, guidelines, but everybody's 
gonna garden their own way and I don't care how you guys garden I just share mine with you and I want to share with you guys good resources in case you need a step-by-step -step guide and you don't just like winging it or you know <laughs> doing it like I do because I've done it for so long and uh, yeah I think it's definitely really helpful you know to uh, to read a book like this another the book that they bought that maybe is uh, more technical for you tech heads out there it's actually called the ideal solar handbook for the new for the new agriculture by Michael S. Astura with Agricola. So this one is actually from uh, SoilMinerals.com and um, a lot more technical for those tech heads out there. Now some of the other things I want to show you guys uh, real quick is uh, this guy. This guy is their tubing bender. So literally you just buy this tubing bender once. This tubing bender allows you to take standard EMT conduit from like Home Depot or Lowe's to bend your own hoop houses or hoops for your raised beds. This will save you a lot of money instead of having to buy the hoops yourselves because uh, the EMT conduit is actually quite expensive. So yeah, it's definitely worth investing in uh, one of these uh, hoop house benders or hoop benders. Another thing I learned about here, which is very interesting today, and I actually didn't realize this earlier, is that they got this uh, locally produced Western Organics gypsum product that comes in a bag, and this is a sample of it. And in, in this uh, Western gypsum, basically what this company is doing, they're taking the wallboard out of people's houses, they're recycling it, crushing it up, put it in a bag, and then selling it back to you. Now, I probably wouldn't have a problem with this if this was like 50 years ago when, when wallboard was really wallboard made out of real gypsum, but now the wallboard is coming from China with who knows what kind of chemicals in there, and they're taking this and powdering it back up, and then they're selling it back to you guys. So you wanna watch out for if you're buying gypsum that it's not just a recycled wallboard that's crushed up, because I mean, there's pieces of fragments of uh, paper in here and all this kind of stuff. So what we're gonna do next in this episode is actually we're gonna get an opportunity to talk to one of the gardeners here that made all this happen. We're gonna ask her some of the things about gardening in Las Vegas that she's learned and maybe some of the reasons why they're growing in the fashion they are. But And also, we're gonna share with you guys their garden blog website where they share what they're doing all the time here in the garden to get the results. They're showing like really cool articles about comparing different kinds of trees. They're sharing a lot of different techniques that they're doing and hopefully soon they'll share some of the amazing deals they've gotten on plant clips and all this kind of stuff because they're like me, they're good deal hunters and they like to get a deal as well. So now we're here with April, the artistic gardener, one of the gardeners that make this whole place happens, her and her husband. And we're just gonna ask her a few questions. So the first question for you, April, is uh, why do you start growing all this food? I mean, this is a big job and many people think you can't grow in Vegas. Oh, you can grow, trust me. I mean, you can see. But the reason why we started to grow is, is for health reasons. Um, I, a couple of years, I got really, really sick. And, you know, they couldn't diagnose. I totally gave up on conventional medicine and um, went through um, an integrative doctor and part of my health regimen was um, to eat more produce, more greens, um, but at that time I could not eat raw or fresh greens, so I had to eat, you know, eat it in the more of the form of soups. Um, so you know, we went to the local grocery store, got our vegetables, and yeah, I did notice improvement um, in my health, but it wasn't until we started to grow our own, which was always our intention. Um, but as my health got a little bit better, a little bit better, I was stronger and able to get out into the garden um, and just started really growing our own. And as soon as I started eating my own produce, the improvement in my health was phenomenal. I mean, at the grocery store, produce compared to what we're making, huge difference. And my progress in my health is just, it just continued to, to get better and better the more I eat from the garden. Wow, I mean, I talked about that a little bit earlier. I mean, just the nutrient-dense foods. I mean, just because you're growing in your garden doesn't mean it's automatically going to be more nutrient-dense in the store. It depends on the practices you're using. So, April, do you want to share, you know, uh, some of the gardening practices you do that specifically, you know, make at healthier plants which have more nutrition than store-bought or many other gardeners here in Vegas that may not be doing exactly what you're doing? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, we... My husband and I um, truly believe in mineralizing your soil and in the soil health, which is the microbes, and feeding those, which in turn feed your plants. And um, yeah, and just using you know no pesticides, no chemicals, 
Um, nothing that can harm, you know, the, the soil microbes and even our beneficials that we have with our bees and stuff are very, very sensitive to them and what type of products that we use. Um, and, you know, I, I had heard of the nutrient dense um, foods before, um, but just wasn't really quite sure how to quite, you know, take it, you know, a little bit higher level than just going from the rock dust, which is excellent. Um, so actually my technical advisor, who's my husband, um, went online and started doing some more research and, you know, just more and more, um, you know, found some information and we found, you know, an awesome company, um, International Ag Labs, that we're actually starting to use our products now. Um, and, you know, and he's really gotten me more into the nutrient dense portion of it. Um, yeah, and it, it's in the soil. It's, it's the type of soil that you, you get. Um, you know, we don't use any type of manure uh, soils at all. It's all vegetative compost. Um, you know, and just, you know, using you know, everything that we use, uh, again, is um, just feeds the, the soil microbes, which, again, you know, feeds our, our you know, plants, which feeds us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's why I'm doing it. That's why I'm growing a garden, so I can eat the best food ever. And that's what April has also found. I mean, pretty much I preach a nutrient-dense biologic growing style, you know, focused on the microbes and the minerals. Super important, and most people, unfortunately, leave this out. All right, April, so one of the cool things I wanted to share with you is that actually I was born in April, so I'm an April baby. There you go, <laughs> so there you go. I won't forget okay. your name because of <laughs> April, born in April, all right. But anyways, um, what I want to talk to you about next is something that you do that I would only dream of doing because it's pretty, I don't know, it takes a lot of time and I don't have that much time and it's really cool. So I'm going to share with you guys what April does and we're going to ask her more about it and why she does it and all this kind of stuff. So what April does is she has her raised beds and she has it basically graphed out on some paper that she prints out and she'd walk out and kind of plan where she wants to plant things. So she really, really plans things out really judiciously. And after she gets that plan, then she actually goes into a computer program and check this out, man. I'll give you guys a close up of that. It's amazing. I mean, this is her raised bed and she has all her plants and she has like tomato, tomatillo verde and, you know, basil. Every plant is on here. And the cool thing is it's all to scale. And then also she actually has a circle around it. So the circle is how much the leaf spread will be. And so she also has the, the, um, the width and the height. So the basil will get 12 inches wide and 24 inches high. And then, you know, the tom tomatillo will get 36 wide and 60 high so then she basically has all these circles to show what you could plant where. I think this is actually very critical to do when you're doing a mixed bed like this. I like her mixed bed and it's worked out very well for her but you know planning all this stuff out would take me too much time. I prefer to just do like one bed all peppers because I know they're going to be all about the same height and the same width. I'll plant them evenly. It looks symmetrical but this is definitely cool because I want to encourage you guys to grow diversity. I just don't grow diversity in one bed like she does. So. April, why did you decide to grow diversity in the beds and do all this planning that must take copious amounts of time? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, part of the reason is, I mean, I just think it looks nicer, you know. It, do, yeah, yeah, it, does. it does. The woman in me, sorry. <laughs> but, yeah, um, but I'm really into companion planting and the benefits and symbiotic, basically, relationships between the different plants. I'm really into that. And I also like to um, plant pretty densely. I believe that, you know, it really helps to provide shade and, you know, some, especially here in the desert, yep. you know, um, it really, really helps. Um, so, you know, as you can see, I only have a small number of beds so far, which we're going to be expanding, you know, quite a bit, um, you know, just taking our time. But I just want to make sure that I'm utilizing every inch that I possibly can in my beds and getting the most produce, most food that I possibly can out of what we have. So, um, yeah, call me anal, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I just, you know, kind of came up with this plan, did it to scale, it's just in a, a simple graphics program, and then in all my beds, I actually have these white tags that I've numbered, so it's almost kind of like the, um, the square foot gardening, but not, um, it's more of kind of like you're eyeballing it, but um, so each one has a number, on both sides and then I also laid out exactly where my uh, drip lines are at so I kind of use that as a guide as well so then I just you know kind of you know the circles are basically like John was saying that they're kind of the the estimated size and I initially started 
Um, my size is based on some biointensive information that I had found. There's some books out there. But I, what I found is that my, you know, because of all this nutrient dense, you know, good soil and stuff that we're building, my plants are getting much <laughs> bigger than, than what they've said. So I'm kind of making adjustments as I go. But that helps me to know, like, you know, if I'm going to plant, you know, my pepper plant, and I know it's going to be four feet wide, well, I sure better not plant something up, like, you know, 12 inches away from it, or it's going to get buried. It's going to get too shaded, possibly. But, yeah, so then I just, you know, when I come out to plant, I just use these numbers and just, you know, kind of, you know, see approximately on each circle I have, like, an X for the center. So I just kind of know that, well, approximately it kind of goes here. And I have little flags that I walk around and just kind of, place, you know, put in place, and then I just start planting, and it, it works out. And then as the season kind of goes on, things, you know, maybe aren't doing so well, I pull it out, then I start winging it, and I just kind of replace things and put, you know, things in different places. Wow, I think this is an excellent technique to use. I mean, it's, it's systematized, it's methodical, and she's learning when she plants something and it gets bigger than what it said in the book, then she adjusts this the next season accordingly. One of the easiest places you can get the bio-intensive plant sizes is from the Bountiful Garden Seed Catalog. In there they publish all the sizes in general and also they have some really good seeds and I have used them before and would recommend them, bountifulgardens.org. And so yeah, this, yeah, I really like that she's really maximizing the use of the space. I see a lot of new gardeners tend to plant things way too closely and then that may hurt your yield because the plants need to spread out. I mean, I'm looking at her bed here. I mean, it's nicely spaced out. Everything's getting enough sun, so they're gonna be bountiful. But also, she's doing something very important in the desert that I also highly agree with, is, you know, uh, keeping a lot of shade on the ground so we don't get that evaporation off the ground, you know, and, and using a living mulch, something alive, to absorb the sun rays to produce more food for you instead of just having like a wood chip mulch in the bottom that's gonna, you know, keep the soil warm. So yeah, definitely recommend this method if you're not using like a square foot guarding method or other method. And uh, the next thing I wanna talk to April about is that she has a garden blog. She's actually called The Artistic Gardener. And it's a really nice uh, garden blog. I mean, I wish I was a writer to do that, but she is, so she does that. I make the videos. But I mean, even all you guys out there could also start a blog. Last week I went to a talk she gave actually about starting a garden blog and I believe all you guys out there should start a garden blog or a YouTube channel to share what you're doing because your knowledge, your information for your specific area and what you're doing is very valuable to other people in your area. You know, this video specifically is very valuable to people in Las Vegas because they're going to want to do some of the same exact things she's done to get the same exact results she's done. You know, of course, wherever you live, you're going to use some of the concept and techniques that I talk about in this video. And no matter where you guys live in the world, literally there are probably other people around you that are also wanting to garden that don't have as much experience, even if you're a week or two new into it or a, a year or two into it. I mean, they've only been doing this now for three years and everything's quite fruitful and they've learned a lot and they're learning as they grow. So April, how can somebody learn about your uh, garden blog and check it out and, and learn what you're up to in this garden and learn about the updates and all this cool sure, stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, you can just go online and uh, go to artisticgardener.wordpress.com and um, initially I started the blog just to kind of let fr friends and family know um, just about all the ins and out of what we were doing with the house. It's a, a repossessed home that we purchased that uh, really needed a lot of TLC. So, um, and then from there, you know, just Kind of started getting into the gardening. Um, you know, we put in the fruit trees first, and I started kind of talking about that, and then you know, started putting in the vegetables, and you know, I just figured, gosh, there's just so many people out, you know, not just here, but just all over the U.S. that yeah you know, can really benefit. You know, from they live in an arid, dry, you know, climate, and you know, something similar to ours, and you know, and there's just a lot of misinformation, myths going around, even, you know, just here locally, about things that you can't and cannot, you know, can and cannot do in growing. Well, you know, shade, you know, a lot of people say you can't grow under shade. Well, you know, if you pick the specific, you know, proper plants, sure, they can flourish. This is a 30% shade cloth and they're doing great. Um, you know, that, and I, I like to test a lot and I share that on my blog as well, a lot of my tests and kind of what I'm doing and um, just, to share and you know so you can learn from that 
Um, but yeah, I try things out in the sun. I try things out in the, in the shaded area. You know, sometimes I'll put them on the west you know, end of the bed or the south end, and other times I'll try it in the north end just to see, you know, what, what does you know, really well. But yeah, check out my blog. I've got tons of information. I have some plans on um, pulling some stuff together more on the trees and how we actually did our planting, how we prepared everything, and um, I have a, a couple of things on there about like choosing trees and things like that. So yeah, check it out. Yeah, it's definitely really cool. I've already checked it out. Definitely would recommend you guys check it out. You know, once again, I think it's really valuable to experiment and I like that April and her husband has been experimenting here with different trees and different vegetables and you know they'll pull out a tree that's not doing well and replace it if they don't like how it's performing. I mean they're only three years in at this point so they've only lost three years but if they go on and let a tree grow to full maturity and it's not producing well then they got to start over you know it's a lot more time lost especially only on you know the half acre that we're on because they want to seriously grow a lot of their own food on this property which I believe they're on definitely a good start to doing. So April, is there any other things that you'd like to say to my uh, viewers out there today? Sure, you can do it, really. <laughs> Honestly, you can do it. Again, just take your time. You don't have to go out there and invest, you know, hundreds and thousands of dollars right off the bat. You know, start with one bed. You know, fine tune your techniques. You know, play around. Don't, don't be afraid. You know, be brave. Go out there and, you know, and grow. You know, try different things. And then once you have mastered kind of that one bed, get another one, you know, and just kind of just build from there and, and just take your time and enjoy the process. I mean, I definitely want to wholeheartedly agree with her. I always say, you know, one of my favorite sayings is by the inch, it's a cinch, by the yard, it's hard. <laughs> Whether that means you're changing your diet to eating more of the fruits and vegetables that you're growing, or that means growing your own fruits and vegetables, one step at a time, right? Start off, like just like she said, start off with one bed. If you don't have, if you're not growing anything yet, start off with one. Get really good at it. When you know you've done it good, get a second one, get a third one. You know, plant one fruit tree this year, see how it goes. And then next year, you'll learn a few things along the way. Watch some more videos, read some more books. Then the next time you do it, you'll be able to do it better. And each with each incremental improvement, you'll become a better and better gardener and have greener and greener <laughs> thumbs <laughs> like both of us here. <laughs> In any case, I hope you guys truly enjoyed this episode learning about how to grow an orchard at your house, how to grow vegetables and some of the techniques they're doing here to grow the nutrient dense foods. Be sure to check out her blog. I'll put a link down below this video so you can check it out. And hopefully we've inspired you to start growing your own food and even start blogging about it and sharing it with others because this is what's really needed to make changes in this world, in this world that we live in today that's basically geared towards you know industrialized food and taking power away from the people instead of empowering the people with growing their own food and eating it too. So once again, my name is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. We'll see you next time. And remember, keep on growing. All right, this is John Kohler with GrowingYourGreens.com. I have another exciting episode for you. We're actually at the Ecology Center in uh, San Juan Capistrano, California. And today is a short and quick video. The next question we want to ask you, April, is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>